Professor Hisham, uh, you added to the suffering of the Professor Amr talk. <laughs> and I waited the, to be happy, to be funny. By the end of your presentation, these are very nice ideas. We don't know in the future they, they will be proven or not. Uh, but I think the most important way is to prevent chronic kidney disease progression or to prevent kidney disease. So it's better to change our mind from dialysis, from even transplantation, to think of uh, uh, addressing risk factors of, from early beginning. As uh, sure, we really. learned, it. instead of thinking of tertiary prevention, it's better to concentrate on primary prevention. So primary prevention is the only way to improve the healthy care of the... Uh, That's the quality uh, yes. care. Quality yeah. care, quality care. one step of quality care is preventive. Yes. Will uh, machine learning, will, uh, will machine learning them? some uh, complications for example the uh, the hypotension which is a very quite common so, so we are feeding uh, a classifier classifier because our patients are unique يعني وعيانين لكن again يا دكتور هاله بعد اذن حضرتك again ده بيؤد للسفرنج اللي دكتور عمرو كان بيتكلم عليه we know a lot about prediction but we don't have solutions <coughs> We started artificial. Will improve art prediction, improve the mortality. Uh, I know because of the time, because of the time we started. We, we will have the discussion yeah. after the session. Actually, no. any 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 way we have to play on all fronts. We have to play on prevention. We have to play on every front because we need to uh, be successful in every way. Sure. 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 Let me let me introduce my great friend, Professor Muhammad Atiy Al Bayoumi. Professor Muhammad Atiya Bayouni is uh, our faculty's new dean. He has been appointed uh, nearly two months ago as a dean, but he, uh, he was a vice dean for around eight years or even more. And he was my friend for a lot of years, working with me in Manchester. He was my face director when I was a tutor there, and uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, professor Muhammad Atiyah is a professor of pediatrics. Uh, uh, he is interested in intensive care. He is really a pedi pediatric intensivist. And I enjoyed a lot his uh, 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 lectures and talk in nephrology, in part of nephrology, which is electrolyte and acid-base balance. But today, Professor Atiyah will talk about something very interesting. He has a very good talk about that. Gut kidney cross talks in septic AKI. So let us enjoy so, this. So let me to add uh, just uh, one one sentence because I always admire the state of uh, the presentation of Professor Muhammad Ati. You are very clever and talented in education, and this is I, I hope that would be translated into improvement of medical education at Mansoura uh, Faculty of Medicine. And uh, today uh, this uh, this is a very critical issue, which is the gut and the kidney gut microbiome because since antiquity Hippocrates mentioned that death sits in the colon so we are eager to know the secrets of the gut and the kidney cross talk professor Muhammad Ati uh, thank you very much assalamu alaikum wa msa al khair ala hadaratkum shukran doktor Nagy shukran doktor Hussain all panelists uh, gives me a great pleasure and a great honor to be uh, with you and thank you for the introduction I'm not here in any capacity other than uh, being a lecturer and a presenter today. Um, I have a declaration. They already said I'm not a nephrologist. Uh, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Uh, uh, it's, uh, may, maybe for, you, for the audience, it's good that I'm not a nephrologist. So I, <laughs> I have a message that uh, is not only about the, the kidney. Since the early 1950s, uh, the concept of organ cross-talking have actually uh, come under light when uh, they started to find that there are some radiological abnormalities in the lung x-ray of those with a chronic kidney disease. 
the pulmonary dysfunction uh, was thought of initially as congested capillaries leaking and there is increased permeability and they called it aoremic uh, lung. However, that wasn't really true because even in the acute settings, the kidney can trigger remote organ injuries. So it's not only about the kidney, but when the kidney is injured, other organs can uh, suffer. I'll show you some examples before I focus on the gut-kidney uh, crosstalk. But as an intensivist, uh, I know that it is a very bad combination to have an acute lung injury and an acute kidney injury in the same uh, settings. This uh, diagram will explain that the, the lung injury and the kidney injury go in circles. If it starts with acute kidney injury, the kidney, um, I cannot use the pointer, but the, the kidney will release some mediators causing oxidative stress, cytokines, chemokines, uremic toxins, which will go and affect the fluid pressures in uh, the lung, alveolar cell apoptosis, and regulate sodium and water channels causing lung injury. The lung wouldn't stop there. The lung will continue the uh, circle causing even more acute kidney uh, injury by reduced uh, perfusion and by blood gas uh, disturbances. So organs like to talk to each other and actually is not as organs talk to each other we understand organs in a wrong way. It's one body, different systems of the same machine. They are not separate organs. We like to separate them for the sake of a specialty, for the sake of everything, but we, we are one organism, actually. Some uh, publications about renohepatic crosstalk, you know about that more than me, brain kidney uh, cross. Uh, talk. I'm not going through details of that. Lung kidney gross talk. Looks like the kidney likes to talk a lot. So the kidney is in the center of all the, uh, the talks. As an intensivist, I rarely see an isolated case of an acute kidney injury. It usually happens within other clinical settings of shock, of sepsis, of ischemia, of organ transplant, or in a post-operative uh, scenario. However, acute kidney injury that I see is m almost always caused by uh, sepsis. Even if the number here says that only 70% of them is related to sepsis, what I see in my unit is almost totally due to uh, sepsis, and is almost always associated with other distant organ uh, dysfunction, uh, up to 80% of, uh, of the cases. I'm not going through the details, but when it comes to the gut, the gut is the largest immune system of the body. It's by definition, is the largest immune system of the body in the Bayer's batch, in the mesenteric lymph node, in the gut-associated lymphoid uh, tissue. One of the very important organs of our bodies is the bacteria that we carry around. We have more than 1,000 species of living bacteria uh, within, and the number of bacterial cells are 10 times the number of human cells we, we, while we're going around, the cells in our bodies are mainly composed of, uh, of bacteria. And actually, for every single human gene we carry, we carry 100 bacterial genes. So there was a lot of cartoons going around on the internet uh, saying that we're actually bacteria infested by some human uh, DNA. It's, it's one... Uh, it's one to hundred. Is there a relation between the GIT and the sepsis? The answer is yes. And there is a big, big yes. Because as we carry those, uh, what we call the commensals, 
The commensals are harmless as long as they stay within where they live. But if the sepsis causes inflammation and hypoperfusion, and those will affect the GIT, and the bacteria of the GIT will start to translocate and to find its way into the systemic circulation, this will cause a secondary bacterial uh, infection. Let us go to our subject of the gut-kidney uh, crosstalk. Crosstalk means it's bi-directional, so when, when the gut is unwell, the kidney will suffer, and vice versa, when the kidney is affected, the gut will suffer. Let us start with the effect of the septic AKI on the GIT. When, when the disease is, is in the kidney, will the GIT suffer? The answer is yes. And by the mechanisms that you can see, there is an impaired barrier function, gut wall, edema, uremic uh, toxins, and the dysregulation of the gut stem cell uh, proliferation. On the left-hand side is an electron microscope for, I cannot use it. These are two uh, adjacent epithelial cells. Can you see the junction in between? I'm trying to walk along. Can you see that? A very little cleft in between those two cells. And actually, if you look, if you look carefully, that part here, just, just under the alveoli, is very different from a middle part here, and is very different from a deeper part here. And this is beautifully illustrated on the right-hand side. So there are three pieces of tight junction in between gut epithelial cells. The zona occludens, the cadherins, and the dismoon. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, is it clear on the, on the graph? OK. When the kidney suffers, an acute uh, septic injury, the cytokines released will impair those barrier function, and the tight junction in between the cells will not be any tight anymore. So there is what we call the bacterial translocation. The bacteria will find its way to the circulation, and it causes more uh, inflammatory response uh, syndrome. The urea will find its way from the blood to the gut. You, we, we always think the urea, you, you, urea will stay in the blood. No. When the barrier function is impaired, the urea will travel to the, uh, to the gut lumen and will be metabolized into a caustic substance, which is ammonia hydroxide. Ammonia hydroxide will burn the tight junction even more. So do not be surprised. I'm not sure if you see uh, your uremic patients, your stable uremic patients having a lot of GI uh, problems. I'm, I'm sure they do. Uh, th think about something like, like that. That's again explaining uh, the junctions that whether the cytokines, the gut wall, edema, or the urea, they will eventually cause dehiscence and increase the permeability and the translocation of bacteria and of bacterial toxins uh, as well. Without so much details, which you might not be interested in, uremic patients cannot regenerate their gut epithelial cells in the same efficient way like controls. So there is increased apoptosis, which will always increase the permeability, will reduce the height of the alveoli of, of the villi and uh, the thickness of the mucus. So that was the effect of a kidney injury on the gut. It will affect through the uremia, through the uh, cytokines, and through the gut wall uh, edema due to hypervolemia. Can the gut affect the kidney? Let us see how.
I'm sure very soon the, the, the microbiome will be described as an organ. Will, will, they will classify it as an organ very soon. But let us see what the microbiome uh, do to our kidneys. Without details, different colors mean different species. So that's, may, for example, the hair microbiome, the uh, mouth, the skin, the vagina, every uh, part of our body has its own diverse microbiome. Even the stomach as one organ, when it is healthy, it has a different microbiome from when it is diseased. H. pylori positive stomach has a different, completely different microbiome from uh, H. pylori negative. This is the H. pylori negative uh, stomach and this is the H. pylori positive stomach. We will not stop there, but this diversity is important for us. What happens to the, uh, to the uh, microbiome? Will, will the gut flora uh, change during uh, illnesses? Yes, because of the cytokines, because of the ischemia of the leakage, and because of the, uh, of the antibiotics. And if there is a significant change in the diversity of the microbiome, then the gut uh, health will be uh, affected. The microbiome itself can regulate the severity of inflammation through an action on uh, uh, toll-like uh, receptors. Not going through that. I, I hate to explain that figure. It's, it's quite uh, complex. But let us say there is a battle between commensals, which are the good bacteria here. Here, that's how they look and between the bad bacteria or the pathogens, and that's how they look. The simplest way of competing is competing for food. So when the commensals are larger, they can compete uh, for food. They deprive uh, the pathogenic bacteria from the food for the virulence uh, factor. They ferment short-chain fatty acids. That's very important, I'll come to the importance of short-chain fatty acids. They ferment the short-chain fatty acids, increasing the thickness of mucus and stimulating the innate immune uh, organs in, uh, in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, trying to prevent those pathogens escaping through the, the gap between epithelial uh, cells. I'll come to shorter chain fatty acids, you remind me. In sepsis, this battle is lost. There is a change in composition. Pathogens take over the, uh, the gut, they damage the, uh, the tight junction, they find their way into the blood, and they cause systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and they injure the kidney. Short-chain fatty acids, what are short-chain fatty acids? They are polysaccharides, they are fermented by uh, the commensal uh, bacteria and they enhance the local and systemic immunity of the gut and of other uh, organs. Can they protect the kidney? Let us go to some research. This is a murine model of ischemia reperfusion injury. Here you can find the control group when there is no injury. In black is the uh, ischemia group. And here ischemia group treated with butyrate. And the serum creatinine is much, much lower in that group treated by butyrate. And in the middle in the group treated by propionate. And at the far end uh, by the group in the group treated by acetate. So these are the shorter chain fatty acids. When you induce experimental kidney injury and you pre-treat the animals with shorter chain fatty acids, you're actually protecting the, uh, the kidney. In the same experiment, which was published uh, uh, in 2015, 
when you look at the serum urea again in the butyrate group, in the probionate group here, and in the acetate group, there is always a statistically significant lower level of creatinine and urea when you pre-treat the animals with short chain fatty acids. Even pathologically, when they looked at the percentage of necrosis, the percentage of necrosis in the group treated with acetate was much, much lower than uh, the, uh, the experimental group. Also, all the mediators which we talked about were much uh, lower. Before we go further and before we leave the microbiome, can we feed our own microbiome in our day-to-day -day life? The answer is yes. There are some probiotic sources and some prebiotic sources. And I'm sure we'll be hearing those two terms quite often in the next few years. Probiotic is the actual bacteria. And the prebiotic is the food for bacteria, how you feed bacteria. The most important natural source of probiotics is yogurt. Yogurt is a very good source for uh, probiotics. And actually, in our tradition, the Laban Raib is again a very good source for uh, probiotics. Prebiotics can be found. Number one source of prebiotics in food is shikori. Anyone knows what shikori is? Shikoria? What is shikoria? Which is what? Shikori is a series. Shikori, shikori is a series. A series is something like El Figli or El Gargir. Okay. If, if you don't know shikori and series, then you must know uh, El Kurrat, the leeks, onions. Onions are okay. Garlic is okay. Uh, the wheat bran is a very good source for uh, prebiotics. So uh, I'm actually thinking about that farmer on, on the farm 50, 60 years ago with Rigif Aish Amh, Berradda, we fish Basala, and then Siris. شيكوري طيب so uh, corn flakes again is okay if it is a brown corn flakes it's okay so uh, we have around uh, how we can feed our own uh, microbiome and how we can treat our own microbiome abuse and overuse of antibiotics is not friendly at all for our microbiome, and I'll show you. This is a bit of an advanced part, go far from series, that we, we have two types of our gut macrophages. We have a pro-inflammatory macrophage, with M, which is M1, and an anti-inflammatory macrophages, which is an M2. So there are some very early uh, experimental trials. Oh, I, I am, I'm done. So there are some very primitive trials on enhancing. That was published in August 2018 on the role of M2 macrophages. If we can stimulate them to prevent the lung, the, uh, the kidney uh, injuries. So there are some therapeutic targets. If we can take the live microbiota, if we can take the prebiotics, which are the necessary ingredients, if we can uh, use short chain fatty acids, which are propionate, acetate, and butyrate, or if we can selectively decontaminate the gut. Can we take the bad bacteria away from the gut? The answer is yes. C can I have a couple of more minutes, or should I go through? OK, thank you. This is uh, the gut in septic AKI. Here, I don't know how to do it. I hope you can see that. This is sepsis. This is sepsis uh, pre-treated with lactobacillus GG. 
and that the sepsis is untreated. Those blue dots are actually the, the colonies. So the colonies are very little when you treat with lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is the live microorganisms that we're talking about, is the actual commensals, or the bifidobacterium lactis on the other side. So you can uh, interfere with the bacterial colonies in, uh, in the gut. This is a very interesting one. Those are the villi, the, the GI uh, uh, villi, and how they look like. That's how they look like in sepsis here. But when you treat with lactobacillus GG, you actually keep the thickness and the integrity of the villi. And here, when you treat with uh, bifidobacterium again. So the difference is huge in the structure from this one here, septic, or when you pre-treat with lactobacillus uh, uh, GG. When you talk about decontaminating the gut, some people will ask, you're killing everyone in the battleground, isn't it? So you, you're going to decontaminate the gut. You've been talking for half an hour about the useful commensals, but you're going to kill the useful commensals and, as well. The answer is no. In the acute settings, you can decontaminate the gut safely. Why? Because actually, the gut flora will vanish in the acute setting before you interfere. This uh, article was uh, published in 2011, and they have studied the uh, colony count of the useful commensals very shortly after an acute insult, and the count was one over a thousand from the normal count in the control group. So you have nothing to worry about because the good guys are already killed. They have gone away. So it's one over a thousand of the control. Whether is it only intestinal hypoperfusion? Did they just escape the battle? Or was it the toxicity of high concentration of oxygen? Did we overuse antibiotics? We, we don't know. But anyway, those good guys have uh, gone. So there are some research is going out about selectively decontaminating uh, the gut by using uh, oropharyngeal antibiotics and antiseptics, and will that affect other organ damage or not? We had our own uh, trial in, uh, in Mansoura, that's the MD thesis of one of my students, when we actually started to contaminate the gut in every patient in a randomized controlled uh, manner. Group A didn't receive any decontamination. Group B received gut decontamination. Group C received gut decontamination plus anabolized antibiotic. We, we had a different purpose of the research, but we had very interesting results. That's the incidence of our ventilator-associated pneumonia was much lower. Sepsis was much lower in the group that we used the decontamination, multiple organ dysfunction, and even a lower uh, mortality uh, rate. We have a shorter length of mechanical ventilation, but we didn't have a shorter length of stay. So wh what actually happened in that trial shortly is that the, the gut was empty for the pathogenic bacteria and was hit by hypoxemia, by hypoperfusion, and the possibility of those colonizers to find access to the bloodstream and to cause remote organ damage was there. So actually, by decontaminating the gut, we managed to do that. So are there some uh, therapeutic interventions? Yes, there is evidence for probiotic. I've shown you uh, the effect of using the lactobacillus GG and the bifidobacterium. There is supplementation with shorted chain fatty acids, probionate and acetate, evidence for selective decontamination of the digestive tract, and very preliminary evidence for M2 uh, macrophages uh, maneuver. 
Thank you very much. And I apologize for the time management.